Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce Rudolf Mester. Uh, Rudolf is a professor who has a joint appointment uh, at the uh, Goethe uh, University in Frankfurt and also at Linköping uh, University in Sweden. And he's done a lot of works in various uh, areas of computer vision, including motion estimation, uh, which is what he's going to be talking about today, as well as automotive uh, guidance and navigation. Welcome. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Rick, for the kind introduction. And thank you for having the possibility to be here. That's uh, interesting for, for me, of course. First time to Seattle, first time to Microsoft Research here. Um, well, um, I, would uh, I would like to use my time today for first starting with giving some brief uh, glimpses of what we are doing at the two locations in Frankfurt and in Linköping in Sweden. And uh, the main part of uh, today's presentation will be uh, a little bit more theoretic, but hopefully, well, at least, at least as I think, uh, also relevant uh, for future improvements in motion analysis. Um, but let me first start with the more colorful things uh, which are related to our activities. So, uh, that's the outline, and this is one of the activities that we did uh, several that we started several years ago in in Frankfurt. So we were working with different robots. You see here are several members of our robot zoo, uh, and the interest that we have in this in these machines is uh, is of course to let them navigate autonomously. In this case, in the case of the machine with the ladybug on top, and also in the case of the uh, fish eye peephole lens, which, which you saw on the other robot. Uh, the approach that we addressed in our research was navigation by using circular harmonics. That means uh, omnidirectional representation of what you see in a more or less uh, 100, uh, 360 degrees environment. And as I said, representing it by circular harmonics. There is one activity which is also quite pro popular in different universities in, uh, in Europe, namely uh, um, activities uh, in terms of um, a certain uh, league of the uh, Robocop, uh, in this case the humanoid uh, league, where we have been uh, active in. And something that was also um, quite important for uh, me and uh, several members of my group in Frankfurt was uh, segmentation and uh, what you see here is for instance uh, just a sample of some uh, dynamic super pixel uh, segmentation approach which we um, investigated uh, about two years ago. Uh, the interesting thing about this specific approach is that uh, you get a segmentation which is as much as possible consistent also in the temporal direction and which, in contrast to uh, many other superpixel approaches which have been published recently, explicitly uses a statistical model for the textures which are in the uh, individual uh, superpixels, and also, a, a, as you might uh, already assume, uh, a Markov random field approach for the region shapes. So. Uh, Rick already mentioned, or I mentioned, I don't know, uh, that we have uh, also um, joint activities with different parties from the automotive industry. For instance, this is, this is just a glimpse into some work that we did uh, together with Daimler, or more specifically, Peter Pingera, who is an external PhD student of mine, uh, working most of the time at Daimler, did which is dealing with uh, um, detecting um, far away objects which are moving independently of the static environment. So this obviously this is an important task in autonomous driving or in driver assistance to detect those individual objects 
as soon as possible. So um, apart from that, there are uh, some activities which are related to a seemingly very different approach to computer vision, namely something which is uh, dealing or taking in a biologically inspired uh, approach. Uh, this is something that uh, a, a, a PhD student of mine, Christian Conrad in Frankfurt did. Uh, this is um, work which takes a biological inspired uh, approach to establishing correspondences between different image areas or between different cameras or between different re retina. And this is basically working on a temporal analysis of, uh, of the signals. That means we do not use at all the spatial arrangement of the individual pixel signals. It's like an unsorted or two unsorted bundle of, uh, of signals which come in. And we try to identify the relations, the ge geometrical relations and the photometrical relations between uh, these signals from two sensors or two cameras or two eyes uh, using their temporal signatures. So I. Uh, so that is basically the, the approach that we take. So we look at the time signal. I hop over the algorithm. Uh, what we obtain from this kind of analysis is something that we, uh, that we um, denote as an accumulator field, which gives some kind of a probability-like uh, representation of the, uh, of the uh, relation between one pixel in, for instance, the left image and uh, the other, all the other pixels in uh, the other image. And if you have a simple one-to-one -one relation, it looks like this, so you have more or less a direct impulse. But very often you have also scenes where you have a moving uh, relationship, obviously. So, for instance, if the, uh, if the depth is varying in a stereo system, and then you get something which represents so to say, the temporarily changing uh, relationships between uh, pixels uh, in, in both areas. So that is basically a distribution over that sector of the apipolar line, which is uh, represented by that kind of distribution. And of course, if you don't have any uh, relationship at all, you don't get anything which, is, which shows a clear, uh, a clear uh, well, correspondence. And we use this, for instance, uh, in order to establish uh, relationships between dynamic scenes, which are seen from two cameras uh, with different viewing points and possibly also very different lens settings, etc. And uh, I will show you a video how this, this actually proceeds. So on the left-hand side, you see some seed, uh, an array of seed pixels. And this is, the, so to say, the initial status where they are all assumed to be corresponding to, uh, to the upper left pixel in the right-hand image. But of course, this is something that will change over, the, over time. And I will show several of the videos which are related to that. So, can we... just a moment. What you see here is uh, the learned relationships, which, uh, which of course are based on the fact that there are uh, moving elements in the scene which give a temporal signature. And the green circles or ellipses express the precision by which we know the actual uh, relationship. And this interestingly works also for uh, quite different views on the scene. So here you have a setting where obviously we will have a wide angle lens and a Taylor lens. So the re relationship is rather unusual from, from the stereo case. And you see that there are still some of these ellipses which actually, uh, uh, where we actually have not been able to uh, uh, decrease the, the, uh, the area of of confidence, 
Uh, this is, of course, uh, mostly due to the fact that for some pixels, if you don't see motion, then you won't learn anything. And uh, even more interesting, at least uh, in my view, is the fact that this works also for non-static scenes. So this is a rapid walk through a driving scene where we just drove once around Frankfurt, but actually it was not even needed to, to drive more than uh, about one kilometer to, to end up with a result which is like this. That means he, obviously this one is coming from uh, a pixel where we could not establish the relationship. And for the other pixels, you see that the uh, longitudinal size of the ellipsis expresses, so to say, the distribution along the epipolar line uh, for, for this uh, uh, stereo camera setup. I should have said this in the beginning that this is about a stereo camera. And you can even do that for uh, a, I'm sorry, that was the wrong one. You could even do that for, oops. For the case of, uh, we have already seen that. We can do that also for a monocular camera, so to say, uh, even in very strange optical setups like this uh, fish eye lens. And uh, this also learns, so to say, the distribution of the, um, of the displacement vector field. And this is something that besides that we uh, have the hypothesis that, that this is uh, possibly also happening in biological systems that these relations are established on temporal uh, signatures uh, is quite useful for us in order to establish something which we denote as uh, motion vector field priors, which we would like to use in order to bias, so to say, uh, motion vector field analysis. And if you do sort of that thing, then you get, so to say, some, some mean uh, vector fields which express, so to say, the typical motion situation. Okay, I hope over this, uh, because I have shown the main things from that area already. Okay, so that was the biological inspired piece. And then um, this was so far happening mostly in Frankfurt, and then there are several activities which we uh, are, uh, which are mostly placed in Sweden currently. <clears throat> uh, in Sweden, we have several projects which deal with uh, vision for automotive applications. Uh, we have an experimental car, which you will see in a second, uh, and we are exploring different questions or different tasks in that area. For instance, uh, one of them is a um, the, the task or the goal to achieve uh, real-time full 360-degree uh, um, environment sensing using, using a visual sensor. Um, in order to show you what we do in that area, let me step to this slide. This shows our experimental car which we have in Linköping. So it is equipped with a uh, ladybug uh, three camera and uh, quite um, a large set of different other sensors which are important for us because they allow us to obtain uh, ground truth on the ego motion of the car and on the attitude of the car with respect to the ground plane and, and uh, similar information. So we have IMU on board of course and some precision sensors which you don't see very clearly, but they are here and here, which measure the attitude of the car, uh, GPS, of course. And all of this is recorded uh, online during test drives and uh, results in some data sets which can be visualized in different ways. I will use this representation. So 
So this is showing one of the, the test drives in normal uh, Swedish weather conditions, as you see. Um, so it starts with a single camera view, and, and if you, as you will see in a second, we have far more information than that. So we have the full 360 degree information. And all of this, together with the different sensor information like the GPS, etc., is recorded uh, and can be accessed using a special stream file format which we developed, which allows us to uh, play back driving situations in the lab. Uh, and the nice thing is that this kind of data is publicly available, so people who are interested in that kind of data uh, may look up uh, the specifics on our uh, website. Okay, so that's again the configuration of the whole thing. And this is, um, so to say, the, one of the data sets that we use for the things that I will uh, discuss a little bit later. Um, no, that's not the right one. This one. So, this is the, uh, the barcode for accessing that information. Uh, the research goals in that area are uh, ego motion estimation, generating, uh, generation of dense local 3D point clouds uh, from which, uh, so to say, models of the environment are formed, detection of obstacles, detection of independently moving objects. Obviously, some standard questions in the uh, in the area of uh, uh, of uh, automotive applications of computer vision, and I I will go a little bit more in in uh, some specifics of what we do there. But one thing I would like to mention already here is that uh, a recent research that we did uh, was dealing with um, densifying uh, initially sparse. Um, correspondences which we have because obviously if you use something like a, a global feature a feature approach SIF and descriptor matching SIF, SIF or brief uh, where we are more tending towards using fast approaches like brief uh, and then refining them using uh, local differential uh, optimization using the Lucas Canada style approach uh, this can obviously only be applied to specific object uh, points, which are, so to say, uh, good enough for being tracked. And th these are limited in numbers, and they are not sufficient for giving you a dense model of the environment, and they are also unevenly distributed in the image. And so what we do currently is uh, working on track densification, that means we first extract tracks which are uh, working on corners or corner-like features and use the information about the motion that we have, for instance, uh, the epipolar field in order to densify these tracks, where we can uh, use also linear structures, structures which are not edge-like but only, um, which are only line-like or one-dimensional. Uh, can be matched if you have already the epipolar structure. That, that is something that is currently going on and this is quite useful because it allows us uh, using this constrained KLT approach to uh, very strongly um, increase the number of matches for uh, those sequences. Okay, so that was this one and um, now, some more information on tracking and reconstruction and uh, dynamical uh, structure for motion. This is something that we do also in this uh, automotive context, mostly in, <coughs> in Sweden currently. The main, main person uh, 
behind that is Michael Persson, uh, a PhD student at Linköping University. Um, this is about the, the, the target is live estimation of static and dynamic 3D structure and motion using one or more cameras. Currently we are dealing with one camera only, but of course the target is to use several of them like in the ladybug arrangement that we have. Well, applications are obvious, driver assistance, autonomous drivers, uh, driving, uh, we could also use it for uh, augmented reality. How, in principle, this is also rather obvious, key point feature detection, tracking local bundle adjustment. That means local bundle adjustment over a uh, over a set of keyframes which, which are, so to say, shifted in a FIFO-like manner uh, across the, um, the sequence. The ultimate goal in this is, uh, of course, overcoming the static world limitation, uh, which is common in single camera systems today. So, so uh, currently we are fighting very strongly against the, prob the, the specific problems that, that you have when you have lots of uh, independent, independent moving objects, but we um, actually would um, we insist in in not using stereo information and try out what is feasible using only one eye because we as humans obviously can't do it. Uh, so there should be a way to to do it as well using a computer. So the desirables are quite obvious. Uh, the uh, the approach that we currently take is. Uh, rapid corner detection using some uh, modification of the fast uh, detector, global descriptor matching using brief, uh, then using reprojection priors if, if they are available. That means if we have some information about the ego motion, then, then we of, of course use it. Uh, Sub-pixel refinement using a, a Canada Lucas Tom, uh, Tomasi style tracker. And um, well, the classic KLT suffers with, uh, obviously, with trouble from long displacement. So we use a combination of, uh, so to say, uh, descriptor-based matching and then the, the KLT as some kind of a, uh, afterburner. So uh, for the uh, 3D reconstructions, again, the desirable, the desirables are obvious. The uh, approach that we uh, that we take is uh, auto initialization using uh, essential matrix uh, approach, uh, rather late outlier removal, uh, local pose and uh, position, then P approach, keyframes obviously, and the window, and the window is in terms of uh, um, time windowed bundle adjustment. And uh, the system that we currently are working on. <coughs> Um, well, I will show you some example samples. We mostly test it on the Kitty data set. Uh, and, uh, well, I, basically I said most of these uh, issues already. Statist some statistics about that. Kitty frame uh, rate is 10 frames per second. The image size is uh, um, 1,241 times 276. Processing speed that we uh, that we currently obtain is 15 frames per second on an Intel Xeon uh, 2.4 gigahertz four kernel system and with two, two threads currently. Um, we have a temporal bundling window of seven keyframes and uh, typically average number of feature points uh, about 1000 or 1100. For a wide range, the processing cost scales about linearly with the number of the features and the processing speed is higher unless uh, every frame is selected of, as a keyframe. So in the videos which you will see in a second, we show three circles which are all related to the epipole. The green one is the epipole estimated from GPS and IMU information using some kind of uh, Kalman filter. For that, the yellow one is the estimated apipole uh, as, uh, as we estimated is using this bundling approach. And the orange one is, is a static one which only indicates more or less the forward motion. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the number of features 
which are shown is reduced uh, in, as to improve the visibility, uh, but we use about 1,000 features uh, for tracking. So the first video shows some displacement vectors, and I apologize for always having to switch back and forth. <clears throat> so this is showing a sparsified version of, of uh, the displacement vectors which we extract and you see in the middle you see those three different kinds of apipoles. <clears throat> So, and as you see, the critical part is usually if, if you go into the curve, because then obviously you have much uh, longer displacement vectors. And getting the curves okay is a uh, quite important issue. And of course, to get all these uh, fine structure of the motion, uh, the, the pitching of the car, etc., is of course also important for the fine structure of everything. Okay, so that would be this one. And I directly go to a visualization of the tracks. So you see quite nicely from the tracks, you see sometimes the, the uh, ego dynamic of the car, which reflects, of course, also in the tracks. If you drive over some... Um, something in the road. So this is again a sparsified representation of the information that we actually process in order to get ego motion and 3D structure. <clears throat> Maybe you'd better start with your main talk. Okay, yes. Uh, but there is one video which I actually would like to show, namely this kind of pseudo stixel approach which we usually use in order to, to uh, make clear that this kind of information can actually be used for uh, navigation, avoiding obstacles and things like that. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, this being said, I uh, would like to go into issues which are more theoretical than these demos which I showed so far. And this consists of two parts which are rather closely related and which both uh, which both give uh, some kind of a, as I see it, estimation theoretic flavor to the, pro, uh, to the problem of estimating matches and correspondences. So obviously we all know image patches, signal patches, matching is a central task, uh, not only in computer vision, but also in other applications such as in sonar, in material science, etc. So what we need is an integral as I see it, an integration of existing motion estimation methods because actually there must be a common core to all these different methods which are around differential methods, sometimes also called an optical flow, block matching, discrete correlation, Fourier-based method like phase correlation. And it is essential that this integration is performed on the basis of a signal model. That's uh, at least my uh, conviction and this signal model should be a statistical one because only a st statistical one uh, allows you to make statistical predictions about the performance of a method and it should integrate knowledge which we have about typical image signals uh, like the, these typical 1 over f spectra and uh, characteristics of the noise etc. So um, if you just uh, consider the, the matching problem, uh, how I would like to model this is that we have two measurements which you see on the right hand side, two measurements uh, 
here denoted as y of x and z of x, uh, which are, so to say, caused by the same signal, uh, which is subject to different, um, to different um, well, modifications or transforms. There might be a multiplicative uh, transform, like these coefficients a and c. There might be an additive shift on it. Normally, this is not that important. And uh, there might also be, so to say, some impulse response related between the original signal which is moving and the one which you can actually measure. And the measured one is, of course, also affected by some additive noise normally. And these two formulas express only the same thing that you also see in the block diagram. So the impulse responses, they can be unit impulses. That would be, so to say, the trivial case. Uh, but they could also be possibly different, uh, different kernels. For instance, in the stereo case, then, then you could have differently, uh, uh, different uh, point spread functions for, for the two cameras. And then this is an issue. So <clears throat> if, you would like to, um, if you would like to address this from a statistical point of view, then uh, you, of course, the first thing is you write up the things that you have, the measurements, the kernels, which, uh, which are given except the shift you are interested in. That means the shift between the signals, the two version of the signal is implicitly uh, inherent in, th in these kernels. And this unknown is the signal itself uh, and the relative shift. And of course, the noise signals and the multiplicative factors. A and C, and the additive offsets, B and D. So quite a lot of uh, unknowns and only few measurements. And what we, can we do uh, for that? Well, we can distinguish between two classes of approaches, obviously. Linear or affine models, which are the tri almost trivial ones, where the kernel, the, the impulse response, is a, just a trivial filter or a direct impulse. And th that boils down then to estimate the gain ratio between these two different multiplicative factors and the offset difference. And this leads to a minimization of some of squared or absolute differences, but with some modifications which are uh, uh, going to be shown in a minute. And the models which allow arbitrary or constrained transfer functions, uh, they lead to phase correlations, phase correlation approaches and uh, their variations. So the phase correlation, as you possibly know, is a rather old technique, but it has uh, found some new interest rather recently for motion uh, estimation. So let's first look at the case one, trivial channel impulse response. That means that we can simplify the, the uh, block diagram in, in, in a sense. We only have the multiplicative and additive things. And this thing will appear a little bit later, but this is, so to say, a preview of what is actually coming out if you perform this in, in some uh, statistical sense. Namely, it turns out that this is a direction estimation problem. Finding the unknown signal in which, where you have two or more copies of an, of an unknown signal is basically a direction estimation problem, which uh, is related to an eigensystem uh, approach. Subspace estimation, you could also say. Well, I, I will explain this graph uh, in, in a minute. So let's look at analyzing signal matches under illumination changes. That's the scenario. I would like to stress that uh, even though we are, of course, thinking about two-dimensional templates and uh, two-dimensional search areas and candidate patches, which are moved somewhere in this area, uh, the mathematical representation is only a vector, and uh, I will use this vector notation throughout the whole uh, presentation. So as you know, there are, uh, there are two fundamental approaches, residual measures. You could go for the differences between uh, corresponding or potentially corresponding pixels and have some, some cost function and a weight function. Uh, or you could go for some correlation measures. And obviously, it's known that these are related, closely related to, uh, to each other. But uh, I, as I will show, this relation can be generalized in some interesting way. So we focus here on 
measures which are using quadratic cost function. Um, and this includes obviously zero normalized sum of squared differences or zero normalized uh, cross correlation, which are prominent uh, and very often popularly used representatives of these class. And that means that we do not address here in, in the rest of the talk the highly interesting family of rank order or sensor based filters, which in, at least in, in our view, are nice for generating, uh, so to say, fast hash functions for searching and which should always have some kind of a local afterburner uh, in order to, extreme, uh, to, ex uh, to uh, extend precision. So uh, we quantify the similarity or dissimilarity uh, taken from the signal. The question is, do these two measurements come from the same signal? And we would like to provide probability measures for this. And uh, this is important. We would like to do this for a signal model which includes uh, illumination changes. And the illumination changes are expressed by these two unknown multiplicative factors, C1 and C2. So I slightly changed the notation here. Perhaps you have noted this. This is, uh, gives more compact expre expressions. So the mathematical model for the two measurement vectors is, is written down here. Again, this is the noise vector. This is the additive offset. That's the multiplicative factor. <clears throat> so, uh, well, I already said that. So since the scale of the unknown signal s, that's the one which goes in on the left-hand side, is not known, we fix it to a norm 1. So we have an additional constraint, which is expressed by equation 2. And the additive terms, they are not really critical. They are compensated for easily by subtracting the uh, vector mean from the input signal that is expressed by equation 8. So we don't care for the additive factors uh, uh, in the rest of uh, the analysis. So why not simply normalizing the zero mean vectors? That's uh, often asked because uh, this normalizes also the noise terms in, in, uh, in a way which is to some degree uncontrollable. That means that we are, uh, uh, if we, so to say, uh, have a varying vector for a uh, varying uh, multiplicative factor for the residuals, then we, we really have to consider this uh, if we would like to make quality uh, statements. Um, secondly, because not all multiplicative factors are equally probable, yeah? multiplicative illumination changes by a factor of 1.1 or so are obviously often to be found, but by a factor of 3 or 4 is very rare if this ever happens. And if you normalize, you, you throw away that kind of information. And thirdly, since the illumination changes, they are global or semi-global effects. That means you must or you should consider that almost the same thing happens to all the patches which you actually analyze. So, oops, that's the same thing. So we address the problem as an estimation task. And for that purpose, we determine now the best combination of all the unknowns. That is the unknown signal vector, the unknown uh, multiplicative constants, the unknown noise vector, which are consistent with the observation. And like always in fitting a model to the data, we regard those values of the estimated uh, noise vector, or also known as the residuals, which are obtained from this joint optimi optimization. Um, the residuals can be evaluated in terms of a given, given probability model. That means if you know something about the noise in your images, then you can directly make uh, very stringent statistical tests of whether a res residual of so-and-so is actually uh, can be expected, or you can uh, subject them to a tr threshold test. And for each assumed combination of the unknown signal S and the parameter vector C, we can, of course, write the residual as in equation 9. And, of course, we can square it and we sum, can uh, sum it up. And then we get, the finally, the expression here, 
which is obviously depending uh, on the measurements, the measurements ZI, and uh, these unknown CI and the unknown S. So um, if we now collapse all the measurements that we have, usually we have only two measurements, but this is even working for uh, matching approaches which compare more than two, match, uh, two patches. If we collapse this into a data matrix Z and uh, put this into the expression for the total residual sum, we get something uh, which is, uh, has a, an, a slightly nicer shape as expressed in equation 15. And obviously, <clears throat> a low val value of Q indicates that this is a good fit between the measured signal vectors Z1 and Z2. And, uh, well, according to the chosen model, they are collinear or almost collinear. And there is an instructive geometrical interpretation to this. Uh, <clears throat> which is shown here. So uh, you can assume these two vectors, the, the blue ones, R1 and R2, are obviously collinear, and they are, so to say, the undisturbed, undisturbed uh, original uh, signal contribution. Then there is an additional noise term added onto them. That would be the red vector D1 and the red vector D2. And the result of that is the um, is the measurement vector Z1 and Z2. <clears throat> and obviously our task is to, to estimate at least the direction of these two blue vectors from only Z1 and Z2, because these are the only uh, vectors which we are actually given. And um, this is uh, a direction estimation problem. Uh, and that can be addressed by minimizing the sum of the square distance vectors d1 and d2. And this uh, is very similar to the case of illumination invariant change detection, which has been analyzed by some colleagues and me uh, already some time ago. <clears throat> so um, if we... Uh, uh, we start by determining the uh, unit uh, uh, vector S, the signal direction, using the constraint that we have uh, given to the, to the uh, signal vector, namely that it should be a norm 1 vector. And this, after a little bit fiddling with the algebra, turns out into a, La a Lagrangian function, which looks like this. And this has a, because, uh, um, well, this has a, a well-known solution, namely the, the optimum vector S is uh, just the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue, lambda 1, of the moment matrix Z times Z transposed, which is a relatively large matrix if the vectors Z are large. And this eigenvector can, however, uh, nicely be also computed uh, from uh, all, all the relevant information, so to say, can be computed in closed form from the eigensystem of the other outer product matrix, namely Z transpose times Z, and this is usually only a 2 by 2 matrix, obviously. And since a 2 by 2 matrix, symmetric, has only three independent entries, these are the only entities which are of interest. And as you see, you can directly interpret this. This is the correlation, uh, sorry, this is the correlation between the two vectors, and these are expressing the energy or the length of the two vectors. And these ones are the important ones. And if you go along these lines, then you estimate the, uh, the uh, multiplicative ratio between the two unknown coefficients, C1 and C2. This turns out to be a very simple, uh, a sim a very simple function of these three independent components. This one, which appear reappears here, this one, which reappears here, and the cross product, which reappears here. And this is just the estimate of this multiplicative factor, which uh, caused the multiplicative range. And it is exactly this multiplicative ratio or estimated ratio 
which should be tested in order to avoid acceptance of unrealistically large uh, or small multiplicative factors. So the cookbook re recipe for doing all this is step one, subtract the individual mean vectors, obvious. The result is you get, so to say, an estimate of the difference between the additive uh, contributions. Step two, computation of the data matrix <clears throat> from the vector and uh, computation of these three individual terms, alpha, beta, gamma, which we already have seen earlier. Find the two eigenvalues of the moment matrix. Simple thing to do. Um, the matching residual is given by the smaller eigenvalue. That is also one thing to be tested. That's the sum of squared residual. And the corresponding estimate uh, of the gain ratio is given by the equation which we have seen a little bit earlier. And that can be checked. And then, then you basically uh, can check all these entities for plausibilities. And I would like to stress that if you have a complete model, then you should have statistics about how the residuals should be distributed how the multiplicative factors should be distributed and how the additive uh, differences should be di distributed. So this is, so to say, basically the empirical recipe, but you could uh, uh, enrich this, so to say, with a more, um, with a more uh, uh, in-depth statistical analysis. So um, this is quite a rather recent stuff, but we um, experimented with this uh, using stereo benchmark data from the Middlebury website. And um, well, the, the details of, uh, of these experiments are, are to, of course to be found in the corresponding paper. And this measure which we, uh, which we propose, which is so to say a modification or an extension of uh, zero normalized uh, sum of square differences um, is compared to the original ZN SSD uh, function. And um, what, what you get from this is there are differences. And these differences, they appear only, so to say, if, if they are actually those situations where uh, the ZN SSD uh, actually fails. That means if you have too strong um, illumination changes um, or uh, re uh, structures which are um, ambiguous in, in a sense. So uh, that means, um, as you can see, the, uh, this modified measure is, is uh, slightly, I, I have to admit, uh, um, uh, better than the ZN SSD, but uh, um, what is important here is that you have this additional testability. So these curves give the uh, number of correct matches and the mean um, uh, endpoint error of these estimates. Okay. So that these are the ex so, yes. Please. When you're doing stereo matching, the displacement is often a fraction of a pixel. Yes. You're, it sounds like you're only evaluating exactly. integer displacements. For, for this analysis was only performed as, so to say, an, an integer displacement grid, obviously. Yeah? That's of clear that this. Uh, but as you will see in the second part, um, this can also be, uh, so to say, generalized to the, the fractional uh, um, analysis. OK, let's now make the transition from the simple model to the frequency dependent model. I speed up a little bit because I really would like to go to the, uh, to the other part. So I will hop over some of these formulas. Um, so um, in, the, in the case of the nonlinear, uh, sorry, in the case of this configuration here, uh, a good approach is to go into the Fourier space because then, so to say, you have a diagonalization of these operators, with, of these kernels, which are usually convolution kernels. And uh, that means that you can write the same equations as before, 
now in terms of these uh, spectral vectors. The large, the capital vectors, they are, they are vectors of uh, spectral <coughs> amplitudes, so to say. Uh, and you see here the effect of these convolution kernels because they are actually uh, just a multiplication by, um, by the Fourier spectrum of the uh, kernel. So um, that's again the same thing. And as the influence of the additive offsets can be compensated, um, and using the, the Fourier shift theorem, then you can show, and this is old stuff that has been known already 40 years ago or so, that you can identify the, the shift, which is one in one of these uh, operators, uh, by a linear phase um, modulation in the, in the frequency space. So in theory, this looks quite nice, but uh, because all the signals are noisy, then uh, if, if you talk about estimating a phase shift, then you have to consider that, uh, well, if you have two vectors and you would like to, to measure the phase angle between them, that's uh, easy if the noise is small relative to the amplitude of the vector, but it gets more difficult if the noise is in the, uh, in the range uh, of the uh, original signal. And this is a, an illustration which I stole from one of these phase um, uh, correlation um, publications. Uh, on the uh, on the left hand side you see the input images and uh, on the right hand side you see uh, the phase difference uh, in a f in the Fourier domain and you see that in the middle area for the low fr uh, frequencies everything is quite nice you see uh, exactly that that kind of phase shift but in the outer areas uh, well you have almost arbitrarily long phase vectors and that means that the phase gets very noisy for those frequencies where the signal energy is weak or zero. And the problem boils down then, in this case, to estimating a complex space modulated wa wave function in, which is buried in phase noise. Uh, I don't have the time today for going into the details, but obviously you see if the phase noise is, uh, if the noise is small, then you have uh, not so much phase noise. And if the noise gets larger, you get quite some phase noise. And if you would like to improve these signals, there is uh, one method which we recently used, this uh, W spectral processing method, which gives you, so to say, uh, yeah, a, a cleaning of those areas where the phase noise is very dominant. Um, this has also been done recently by uh, by people in my group using a multi-patch phase correlation approach. That means that you estimate the same motion from different measuring windows and combine that information in order to get an overall uh, motion vector. This is important for uh, surveillance applications where you have different patches which should not be moving if the camera is not moving. Uh, and other areas which should be left out from the analysis because you have some moving objects in there. And this works quite nicely using the phase uh, correlation approach. I can only refer to, to that publication. Okay, so that was not everything, but we have one slide set left. And that's this one. And this of course, is also about uh, motion estimation, and this is a slightly different approach to that. Um, it tries to, to um, make certain implicit assumptions, which are in classical approaches like Lucas Canada or uh, block matching or so, to make them explicit and make the relation between the measurable entities and the sort entities explicit. So um, the problem with what, what you find in the literature, if uh, particularly if you talk about uh, differential methods, optical flow, is, and if you talk about the brightness constancy constraint equation, is the uncommented transition between an image signal which is assumed to be differentiable, thus necessarily continuous, 
on one hand and the discrete pixel sample values on the other hand. And the pixel values, they are tacitly assumed as perfect samples. Uh, excuse me. Um, from a continuous signal whose characteristics are not discussed. Uh, so this is, of course, a, a weakness in that. And we would like to take a semi-classical approach to two-frame optical flow. That means the same setting as in classical, but more attention to the notation, more attention to differences between continuous and uh, discrete. So that's our general setting. That's the way computer scientists usually think about it. You have some patch and uh, a second image, and you would like to find a corresponding patch. And in order to find the motion vectors, which you are finally interested in, again, we use this uh, vectorization of the approach in order to formulate the problem. Uh, and um, what you know, uh, or what presumably all of you know from the literature, is that uh, differential, uh, differential optical flow um, boils down to a linear equation system, um, which is, uh, well, this is the sort entity that is usually an increment of the uh, displacement vector. This is an entity which some people call uh, the structure tensor. It is built from the gradients, uh, the vector of gradients uh, inside the observation window. And this is something uh, which is built by the uh, spatial gradients GU and GV, but also by the differences between the two observations Y and Z. And please note that I give different names to the two images here, yeah, Y and Z, in order to get rid of one of the subscripts, which would otherwise be necessary. Okay, so the discrete filters are usually not uh, discussed with some notable exceptions. I'm sorry, if, uh, obviously I did not run the BibTech. Uh, there is a reference to some work by uh, Simon Shelley and Farid and by Hanno Schar. Um, if you would like to, to go to the differential case, then obviously you have to make a, uh, re a reference to the full continuous signal, which is, so to say, behind these discrete samples. So you have to make a reference to that continuous signal. And, um, well, we, um, uh, we try to model the continuous signal here as an element of a precisely defined signal space and also the non-ideal, non-direct sampling uh, with additive noise is uh, contained in the model. And the benefit of this approach is that all approximations and simplifying assumptions, or almost all of them, uh, are made explicit. So let, let now S of x be the continuous spatial signal, which corresponds to the illumination pattern. And uh, due to the optical point spread function of the lens, uh, it is low pass filtered, but it is not exactly band limited in the Shannon sense. Uh, and if you have motion, uh, motion vector field here, then the two illumination patterns on the sensor area could be described in this way. The illumination patterns are both convolved with the impulse response H, which corresponds to the integration performed on this sensor area. And uh, an additional thing is that, of course, due to the interaction of motion and finite exposure time, there could also be some motion blur. Okay, so um, this is describing the two images. The discrete images, Z and Y, are formed by the original continuous signal, which is convolved with this, this kernel, and then sampled at some specific positions, and then subject to some additive noise. And the same thing for the second image, which additionally has here the shift vector. <clears throat> Um, then, if you would like to have the full complete model, you should also talk about the co camera conversion function, which then maps this into the actual discrete values which you, which you have. Uh, you can approximate this very well by a, a fine function using some, uh, some factors alpha and beta and compensate for that. I will not go deeper into that. Uh, also for time reasons, and uh, these 
um, factors can also be nicely be uh, computed on, in a global way using uh, the already mentioned phase correlation approach. So we hop over this illumination variation thing here. Um, <clears throat> so now we model the hidden image signal in this way. Uh, the, the continuous signal is uh, expressed as a serious expansion of some basis function or um, uh, kernel, representative kernel, which is, so to say, repeated at the different uh, sampling positions. That's the two-dimensional sum here, and it has some coefficients for, for each position of, of this kernel. And um, uh, for the kernels, uh, in principle, you are free to choose the kernel of your choice, as long as this is a reasonable image model. For instance, you could pick one member of the family of uh, B-spline functions. You could also pick a band pass, uh, a uh, sync function, but this is rather impractical because it's uh, extending into infinity in all directions. So um, if we model it this way, um, th th then you, you have to talk about the statistics of this continuous signal. The, this uh, continuous signal has a statistic which is determined by the shape of this kernel function, obviously, and of course also by the discrete covariance structure of these coefficients p and m. And um, having this in mind, in principle, you are again free to explicitly model uh, uh, the statistics of both these uh, things such that they fit uh, the, the images which you actually have, possibly also including some physical knowledge which you might have about the image generation process. So, so this is something that you can do. You could also ignore it, so to say, and then take a non-Bayesian approach, just not assuming that this thing has an interesting, um, interesting prior uh, distribution. But you better do it. Okay, it's, unfortunately this is only a forward model, it's not an inter interpolation model. That should be, should be stressed. So now we put everything together. These formulae look a little bit weird, but actually if you have a little bit more time you see that they are very, very simple. In fact, the um, observation Z is obtained in this way plus the noise. And now we plug in here for the signal, we pl plug in our model of the signal space. And then we see one nice thing of this linear models, namely that this kernel here, B tilde, the additional, uh, the kernel which I induced, uh, introduced two slides before, can be, comp uh, can be um, uh, compiled with, this, uh, with the sensor uh, integration function to, to uh, form one effective kernel, so to say. So B tilde and this thing form a new kernel B without any tilde. And that's the thing that, that we continue to use in the following. So obviously we need this also for, for uh, we need also the shifted signal. And for for the shifted signal, we have the nice property that the shift can be expressed by a shift of the basis function. That's also a nice thing. So we could write now the difference between the measurement z and the unknown observation noise v. That's exactly our signal model. And the same thing also for the second uh, image, which has the name y. That's the second image, and that's the unknown additional um, additive noise in that image. So if we look closer at these equations, we see that the right-hand expressions can be expressed by a scalar product of two matrices. And this, uh, well, this is an intermediate representation of the same thing, and a very compact representation where everything is lumped together, so to say, is the residual, uh, the, the observation noise is the measurement minus this term here, where here appear the representative coefficients of the signal, and this is, so to say, summing up all the effects of the kernels. And this one is not 
affected by the motion, and this one is a function of the motion. So um, how to estimate the signal, uh, the signal coefficients? If we, if we know the displacement, then it's very simple. Then you write down uh, the residual. The residual is the sum of the squared uh, estimates of the noise vector v and w. And that would be, if you plug in everything, you get this nice second order form, <coughs> which, has, which can be written also in this style. And you can easily imagine what happens. You get, uh, that's the same formula again. You take the partial derivatives with respect to the coefficients. And you end up with uh, the normal equations for the coefficients. And this gives you finally the uh, estimation equation. And people who are often working with estimation theory recognize this directly because that could also be directly um, derived using the Gauss-Markov theorem of estimation theory. And that was a reference to, for instance, the book by Stephen Kay on estimation theory. OK, so uh, obviously you can write down the residual. And you can test the residual like we did this already in the previous, uh, in the previous approach. I'm sorry, I got lost in my own slides now. And you can look for the local curvature of the uh, residual because this expresses how precise the found optimum is. For some details, please look into the paper. And in order to obtain an expression for the value of the residual, uh, we have to plug in several equations into each other. I hope over the details because you see what ends what it, what it ends at is a function of the observation vectors, a uh, uh, second order function of the observation vectors. And these things here where the um, kernel matrices are again involved. And for the discrete matching case, uh, it's uh, particularly simple because the second kernel matrix is identical to the, the first one. And that means that uh, instead of direct pixel to pixel, some of squares difference matching, what is happening is uh, matching, uh, evaluating a residual on two pre-filtered images. So uh, standard SSD is a special case only for a trivial signal model. Okay, I hope over these data details as well. Uh, another special case of the special case is uh, uh, basically giving you exactly the residual of the sum of square differences. So, but the, it's important to notice that, that these are just special cases of special cases and that we, in order to arrive at this, uh, at this result, we have to ignore totally the, the signal statistics, the signal model, everything. So, so that means if you do this, and, and almost everybody does this, uh, you neglect, neglect quite a lot of things. OK, so we did not even impose a prior on the distribution of the coefficient vector, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many uh, approximations which are, uh, so to say, um, appearing in the course of this derivation. OK. So uh, in the general case, you use priors for, v, uh, for the noise vectors and for the p. I hop over this once again. Uh, and in order to conclude with a differential case, because that's, of course, uh, perhaps the most interesting, we regard again this loss function q. And now we have this uh, kernel matrix BD, which is uh, dependent on the displacement. Uh, in a nonlinear way. And what we do here is we just uh, uh, approximate it by a first order Taylor approximations, where matrices U and V are defined as the, uh, as the partial derivatives of these matrices with respect to the first component of the displacement vector and the second component of the displacement vector. That means that this kernel matrix function is a, so to say, a, 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 
uh, fixed part and some part which is depending linearly on u and v and some higher order terms. And if you plug everything in, and I really speed up very much now, this is only simple alge algebraic uh, notation, uh, manipulation, then uh, you end up at this result, uh, which, is, which should look familiar. Uh, but on the way to this result, you uh, had an explicit point where you saw that in order to get this result, you, you uh, had to make a strong assumption on, uh, on the variability of this uh, coefficient vector p. Uh, if you don't make this assumption, you have a nonlinear equation system. So the original, the real equa uh, estimation problem is a nonlinear one. And if you make this approximation, you end up at this uh, equation. Once again, some matrix times the displacement vector or the displacement vector increment is a, left, uh, is a right hand side uh, which de depends on, uh, well, it depends on the derivatives of, of the signal and uh, the differences between, this, the, between one and the other signal. And this is of course exactly the same structure as we have it in the, uh, in the typical uh, differential case to uh, in, in Lucas Canada equation one, one could say where, uh, which appeared in the beginning of this slide set so it's the same exactly the same structure but what you see here is that these terms here the gradients are uh, replaced by <coughs> their estimates um, using the explicit signal model using the kernel because these matrices u and v and b0 they are all depending on the kernels so what you learn from this is um, it's the reconstructed image signal that plays the essential role in the equation system not the original pixel value that means we have two entangled problems reconstructing the original signal which which is shifted and shift and estimating the shift and the partial derivatives of the signal kernels are appearing in the equation systems by these matrices u and v and as we have seen from some equation sorry for for the missing link uh, for a correct solution of the motion estimation problem we have to solve a nonlinear equation system in u and v and p uh, but with some um, with some uh, explicit approximation, we end up at something which is similar to the well-known thing. And it is up to future work to investigate in which situations and under which conditions of the input data, presumably for strong noise levels, such an iteration scheme is advantageous. And that's basically what I wanted to say today. Uh, in this last slide set, I try to identify the tacit assumptions and approximations which are behind the classical approaches. And uh, I try to point out that the uh, d estimation of displacements and the estimation of the displaced signals are entangled with each other. And, um, well, the implications of this modeling uh, to, uh, to, well, uh, modeling images as belonging to a certain class of signals, including their uh, autocorrelation function, appears, at least to me, a promising target for future research. Okay, yeah, that's it. I would like to thank you for your attention, particularly during the hard part at, at the end. And I'm available for any questions which might be present. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Mm -hmm. Got um, I had a question. So I was thinking the second part when you talked about the going from the discrete to the continuous mm -hmm. signal. If you are trying to match two images, let's say, with different resolutions. Mm -hmm. So now the raw, if you're looking at, let's say, matching two patches, the raw dimensionality of the vectors are different. 
So how, would, would this model let you, uh, the, the normal way of doing things is resampling the two things yeah. to, to yeah. bring it to the yeah. same. Uh, that, that would not be explicitly covered in this model. It would would still have to be extended in order to, to, to cover this case if you have different kinds of samplings in both images, That if, if that's what you're referring to. But, yeah. uh, it's that somehow the kernels and the basis functions, they somehow allow you to... I would can... guess, or let me say so, I would not see, I, I do not see any other reasonable solid way to, to address this. But this may be my lack of uh, imagination. But I would say th this is the way to go. Yeah. I just have a question. Um, what's the advantage of the discrete version of the optical flow compared to the textbook solutions? I guess it may perform better in like lower resolution, dark distortions, or you have other observations. Well. Um, Perhaps this, there's a slight misunderstanding. What, I'm tr what I try to say in the second part is, if, we, if you're looking at the, at the differential approach, then you really carefully should look for, for the modeling of the image, which formally was addressed by, by putting a little bit more emphasis on how you design the derivative filters. Yeah, some people did that, but not everybody does so. Yeah, many people think the Sobel is OK. Uh, and it depends highly on, on the kind of signal which you have, whether this is truly okay or not. Uh, I'm not saying that this boosts uh, things dramatically. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't dare to say so. But what was important for me is to, to, to go away from, from these formulations which are um, implicitly strong approximations and to make it explicitly. And then if you know this, and you say, OK, I make this exp uh, approximation. You can always check an explicit approximation which you make. But if you are not aware that you are doing an approximation, then this might end up in some problem. Yeah? And this is, this is mostly, I, I would say, real advantages, if you look something like that, is if you're going for ultra high precision, like, like in photogrammetry or so, or something like that. And, and I'm aware that people in photogrammetry, for, for instance, I talked with Wolfgang Fürstner about that stuff, they know in principle that, that things like that have to be done. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker once more. Yep. Thank you.